Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hi, everybody. I am Arate Weiler, and I am the Chief Operating Officer of the Atlantic. I hope that you are all enjoying the Atlantic Festival. We're so happy to have you here, and we have a lot more ahead of us. Uh, for now, it is my pleasure to welcome you to a conversation about science, animals, and us. Uh, animal science not only informs us about the natural world, but it also tells us so much about us as humans, why we are what we are. I'd like to thank Allstate for making this conversation possible. Um, please join me in welcoming Angela Worrell, Field Vice President at Allstate, for a few remarks. Hello, everybody. Are you enjoying everything so far? Yes. Yep. I'm guessing that if you signed up for, for a session on animals, everybody's an animal lover. Is that raise of hands? Yeah, pretty much everybody. Well, uh, we're excited. Um, this is the 10th year that we've had a, rela a relationship with the Atlantic. This year marks it. And um, Atlantic has been a great partnership for Allstate. Um, so we've enjoyed that. So it's my pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, Today's lunch is about animals. That was kind of the draw to get everybody here. Um, but the animals, as you know, if you all have them and you have, have our pets, there's a special relationship that we have with our pets and with animals. And it's that human-animal connection that makes one of the most fundamental bonds that we experience in life. And there's a mutually beneficial bond um, that we have that exists with humans as well as animals, from the land that we inhabit to the food that we eat, um, it both are essential in each other, in the health of each other. So for centuries, animals an have made an enormous contribution to agriculture, transportation, but until recently, they've also been recognized as being comfort. Um, so they provide humans with comfort and therapy, especially in life um, situations and catastrophes. And that's what I wanted to talk a little bit briefly about today, because when hurricanes and wildfires uh, come across the country, so they hit the Carolinas, Florida, California, all of last year, you know, we always send, you know, being all state, we send hundreds of personnel across to start to handle people's claims. But we started also sending dogs. So through a partnership with the Alliance of Therapy Dogs, we brought dogs out to these catastrophe centers. So doing that, you know, we're, we're out there at a time that is some, often the most crazy, scary, sad time that our customers are experiencing. They may have just lost everything. So we have these command centers, these mobile units out throughout the states that when we go out to them. And we've always been there um, to bring the people to help restore lives. We used to bring little stuffed teddy bears. Um, which was nice, um, but then we started bringing dogs, and the smiles, you know, that doesn't make it different or better. It doesn't put them back at home, but it gives them an opportunity to just hug a dog. Um, we have supplies and everything, but really the endless supply of hugs from these adorable dogs that are out there with them, and it just comforts. The, especially the children that are out there that are experiencing this devastation. But it helps the parents too. And the parents feel better because their children are now comforted. You know, they, they want their, you know, their children to be, have as much normalcy as they possibly can after a devastating, whether it's a fire or a hurricane. But it's just helpful. So it's something that animals and people and humans alike, it's that bond. And it's just something that we can do together. So I'm really proud of the relationship that we have with the Alliance of, Alliance of Therapy Dogs. I encourage you to learn more about it. It's not just after um, catastrophe situations that those therapy dogs provide such benefit and value. You see them going into hospitals. You see them going into, you know, the areas where people are, you know, have terminal type diseases. But, you know, from an Allstate perspective, it's something that we do that I'm really proud of that's over and above what we can do that people pay us for, you know, to work and handle their claims. It's just something a little extra. So this is a great um, lunch. I'm thrilled that you're here to spend some time with us for lunch. So on behalf of Allstate, thank you for coming. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the session. So I think, Arate, back to you.
Thank you so much, Angela, and thank you again to Allstate for having us here today. Um, and with that, it is my pleasure to welcome the Atlantic's Deputy Editor, Ross Anderson, uh, for a conversation with our staff writer, Ed Yang. All right. Um, I have like more performance anxiety than usual because Arite basically runs our company. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, I, uh, I'm going to give you guys a window into the sausage making that goes into this pan these panels because we're going to do something a bit unusual today. Um, they paired us up for animals because uh, I'm a bit of a dilettante when it comes to writing, so I've <laughs> written about animals a little bit, but Ed has written about them extensively. And so we were trying to think about how to structure this in a way that, like, touches the little tiny bit of expertise I have and like the, <laughs> the ocean of expertise that he has. And Ed is working on, I'll just spoil it for you, Ed is working on a new book um, on animal sensory systems. And usually, this is the kind of thing that we would do after his book was done and published and written and out in the world, and we're trying to sell copies of it. And after I've had a chance to actually prepare some anecdotes and material. <laughs> Well, that's the thing, right? So when you go to a book talk when someone's like pimping their book, they kind of do like the anecdote with like a little tap dance and the punchline and it feels a little phony, right? Yes. Say yes, <laughs> yeah. And so what we decided to do today is give you a window into Ed in the midst of kind of like the searching and the discovery process. So he's reporting this book right now. He's been on the road heading About out to Animal months. Sensory Labs for six months. He's missing from work a lot, I'm sad to report. Um, <laughs> And uh, not because I miss his company, I just miss his pieces. Um, and so we, uh, we want to kind of take you through his thinking as it's at this kind of embryonic stage in this book, and that's what we're going to do. And first, uh, I want to just ask you about the motivation for the book. Your previous book was about microbes. This one is about animal sensory systems. And to me, um, that kind of seems like you're looking to illuminate these worlds that are otherwise hidden. But I, w I was wondering if you'd kind of expand on that maybe. Yeah, that's exactly right. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I love so, answering my own question. Okay, okay. so the, um, the first book was about how um, the microbes that live in the bodies of humans and other animals influence their behavior. So it's about how this literally invisible world um, makes a huge impact, it has a huge impact on our biology and all of the aspects of our being. Um, and the, the new book is very similar, like Ross said. It's about how other creatures perceive and experience the world around us um, through senses that they share with us, like um, vision and smell and touch, but also through, also through senses that we don't have, like the ability to sense um, electric fields, magnetic fields, to echolocate. Um, there's a really important concept that I don't think gets enough play um, called uh, umwelt. So that's the idea that every creature um, has um, a slice of the world around them that they can perceive and understand. Um, and that that slice of the world is only partial and it's very different to what other creatures can experience. For example, just take vision. Um, human vision extends from red to violet across the rainbow. But other animals can see beyond that into infrared. Rattlesnakes use infrared to uh, detect the heat given off by their prey. Other animals can see into the ultraviolet. So they can use that channel to exchange signals that we can't see. Um, similarly, other creatures can smell much better than we can. Dogs are an obvious example. Things have much better sense of touches. They can sense those, um, those electric and magnetic fields that I mentioned that we are not privy to. And so if we had in this room a rattlesnake, an electric fish, an elephant, a dog, I don't know logistically what that would involve. Um, <laughs> live team, let, maybe do that next year. Um, Every one of those animals would be in exactly the same physical space and have a completely different experience of that space. And so when we think about learning more about the world and we think of exploring the unknown, going into space or the deep ocean and so on, I think we sometimes neglect the fact that one of the greatest acts of exploration is actually understanding what other creatures um, experience through the shared reality that we have and that we think we understand, but we are only partial to a very small slice of. Uh, 
So I take it all back. Ed clearly has a bunch of talking points prepared for this book. Um, I want to start with vision, which is where you started in uh, your long and very elegant list of animal senses. And uh, the thing that I remember in the uh, regrettable period before you were exclusively ours at the Atlantic, you wrote a great story for National Geographic about the evolution of vision. Mm -hmm. And um, it, to me, still even understanding something about the science of it, it does strike me as kind of a miracle that, like, the world went from things that do not see to things that do see. And I understand why even that was, uh, even for a very long time, thought to be kind of a definitive proof for the existence of God. It just like had to be a kind of act of divine creation for that to happen. And I wondered if you'd walk us through the sort of early stages of how that happened. Yeah, so um, light provides tons of useful information to um, creatures around us. It can, for those in the ocean, it can signal depth. Um, in signal time of day. And so lots of um, creatures are responsive to light, including things that are not animals, like single-celled bacteria. Some, many of them can sense light. Um, but to go from that to something that we have, an actual eye that forms high-resolution images, um, that has happened many times over, but also only to a small number of groups of creatures around the world. So a lot of animals have very basic eyes that allow them to detect light and to form simple images, but that aren't on the same level as ours. And the thing, thing I think that is important to know about vision is that like all eyes um, are tailored to um, the needs of their hosts. So uh, a starfish doesn't need an eagle's eye, um, an eagle would crash into a tree if it had a starfish's eye. So it's all, it's all, um, it's all very beautifully adapted to the needs of the owners. Um, and um, so when we think about um, when we think about vision, I think our point of view is uniquely skewed by the fact that we have only two eyes and they both face forwards, um, which is not the case throughout the animal world. So take a really simple example: a lot of birds have eyes that face um, to the side, um, and so, so here's an example of what I, what I mean when I say that we, we sometimes forget to take the perspectives of other creatures into account. So peacocks are a very obvious, familiar, beautiful animal. They, males do this wonderful signal where they spread their tails out. And we think we understand that because it's visual and we are visual. Um, when a female peacock watches that display, she often does it facing away from the male, pointing off to the side, because her eyes point to the side. And this has led to a lot of descriptions in all natural history literature of female peacocks, peahens, being coy, because they're not <laughs> looking at, they, we don't think they're looking at the display, but they totally are. Their eyes just work in a different way than ours. Um, similarly, uh, a duck could be a duck. If you put a duck outside there on the street, it will look. It could be looking straight at you, but it can also see the entirety of the sky. Like the entire hemisphere is available to it at any given time. Um, there are loads of animals that have um, eyes all around their bodies, including some that we don't expect. Um, scallops. Anyone eaten a scallop before? Uh, what you've eaten is the muscle of the scallop. If you actually look at the animal itself, it has a rim of, um, some of them have rims of beautiful blue eyes all around the edge of the shell. So how does an animal unite the experience of hundreds of different eyes? Um, we don't know. But that's, I think that's an example of some of the, the, the incredible diversity um, that we have, even in a sensory system like vision, that is so primal to us. Talk to me a little bit about color vision. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really curious. So I remember growing up with dogs and uh, yeah. being sort of uh, almost disenchanted to learn that they were not inhabiting the same kind of technicolor world that I inhabit. Mm -hmm. And it made me wonder ever since really how far or how wide, rather, uh, color vision is distributed across the animal kingdom and more importantly, why? Yeah, um, so I, I think sometimes we have a, um, a skewed view of this because um, we humans are uh, what, what are called trichromats. So we have three different types of cone cells in our eyes that allow us to, like in colloquial terms, see in three colors. But really the combinations of those three colors, which adds up to like a million different hues. Um, dogs and some of our most familiar um, pets and companion animals see it are dichromats, so they only have two types of cones, which so they can only see in two colors. Dogs are not colorblind, by the way, that is a myth. 
Um, but that means that they maybe only see, like, t can discriminate between, like, 10,000 different hues. So their color world is much more impoverished to ours, um, no more so than someone who actually has color blindness, which a lot of people do. Um, but I think that's the wrong comparison to make between us and dogs because um, we came from a large lineage of animals, including um, th that uh, I think ancestrally were tetrachromat, so had four different types of cones um, that can see much more than we can. So almost all birds are tetrachromats. A lot of fish are tetrachromats. A lot of insects are. So actually, our sense, our palette in our vision is much more restricted than what a lot of other, even very basic, common, familiar animals are capable of. And then there are some real weirdos that have, that we just don't really understand. Okay, so um, has anyone out here heard of mantis shrimp? Okay, so a few people, all right. A mantis shrimp um, is not a mantis or a shrimp. Um, it is a type of crustacean, lives in the sea, um, has uh, these arms that, unf that are tucked away under its head and that unfurl um, at lightning speeds to smash into prey. Um, they have the, one of the fastest punches in the natural world. They also have these really incredible, very, very strange eyes. That So I said we have three types of cones, dogs of two, some birds of four. A mantis shrimp has, some mantis shrimps have 12. Um, I think up to 16. Um, they can not only see a wide range, um, by part of the spectrum, including lots in the ultraviolet, they can also see polarized light, which we can't see. That's, um, that's uh, like when you have wear um, sunglasses with polarized filters, you might see distortions in images, that's to do with polarized light. Mantis shrimps can see that. Um, and so there's always been this myth, this conception that they must see like this crazy billion trillion strong kaleidoscope of colors like this rainbow upon rainbow that we are not privy to and actually several years ago a group of australian scientists put mantis shrimps through a color discrimination task and their abilities to discriminate different colors are so much worse than ours and between and so much worse than that of pretty much any other animal that has been studied. So things that we would see as clearly as like red and orange, they'd be like, mm -hmm. looks, <laughs> looks the same. Um, so why do they have 12 cones and what do they actually see? Like genuinely no one knows to this day. There was this idea that um, they just experience color in a very, very fundamentally different way to us that actually might be a little bit more similar to how things like satellites and um, and human-made devices process color. Um, but the, the honest answer is we don't know. So even for this sense that we understand better than pretty much anything else, um, you just can't, you, it's so hard to peer through the eyes of another creature and understand what it's seeing. Talk a little bit, I'm gonna go into writing craft, so indulge me a little bit, but talk about that as a both a philosophical and a writing challenge. Um, I recently, for our March issue, wrote, uh, a piece about animal consciousness in which I found myself sort of regularly trying to inhabit the uh, perspective of an animal and found it quite challenging and or anthropomorphic in ways that were inappropriate mm -hmm. uh, for several reasons. Um, and uh, yeah, I just want to know uh, for you who has tasked yourself with a kind of 300 page um, attempt to do that, how have you been thinking about that? Are you developing a new class of metaphors? Are, are there sort of philosophical tools that you're playing with? What are you doing? Um, uh, well, the honest answer is that I am failing. And that was always the point of the book. So a philosopher named uh, Nagel wrote this very famous paper called uh, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Um, and he quite rightly pointed out that you can't know. So any, any attempt to get into the heads of another animal and to consider what it's like through its sensory abilities is doomed to failure. But my argument is that it is still a quest worth undertaking because it helps us appreciate nature in different ways and other animals in different ways. We are always going to be restricted by the fact that we are visual animals. So we have the senses we have. We can, I cannot see the world through a tetrachromat's um, vision. Even with technology, I cannot do that. So it always has to be a feat of imagination. 
Um, and that I quite like. It's really fun talking to scientists who are meant to be very austere and cold and formal and empirical and get them to speculate wildly about what it is like to be a bat or a mantis shrimp or, any, or something like that. And you do, um, you do enter like really interesting, rich, metaphorical and conceptual space. Um, so, um, so I recently visited a lab um, where a guy called Bruce Carlson studies electric fish. So these are fish that, um, unlike, say, electric eels, which you probably know about, don't pr they can produce electric fields, but the electric fields are not strong enough to stun or kill. What they do is they go out into the world, and they interact with objects in the world, and they come back to the fish, and the fish can then sense those fields to understand more about what's around it. So it's sort of a bit like echolocation, a bit like sonar, but using electric fields. Um, what does that feel like to a fish? We can't know, but we can take some guesses. So we know that the electric fields are sensitive to um, not things like color, which we would be, uh, which we would care about, but things like resistance. Um, so whether something takes a current or not. And living things differ from that, from inanimate objects in that respect. So the electric fish can tell just from the sense whether something is alive in its vicinity or not. They differ in things like capacitance, um, in size, in, in shape. Um, and the f what the fish gets from its electric sense is not like, I don't think it's like vision. When, when people try and um, depict these sort of otherworldly senses, they typically do it in terms of vision. You know, like if you, if you see a sci-fi film where someone has like echolocation, you'll see like a black space and like concentric circles will radiate out and come back and outlining the shapes of an object. So it's always visual. But this is probably more like touch. So it's as if the fish has extended its sense of touch all around it and in all directions. So not just from its fins or from its head, but literally over its entire body. So the way he describes it to me is, imagine an electric fish swimming along. It encounters a rock, some grass, maybe another fish. All of those will create different textual feelings that it will sense over its body. So maybe it's a bit like, um, like if it passes a rock, maybe like a cold sensation will move down its side. Like if it passes another fish, maybe something hot or I, I don't know, like spicy, whatever you want to call it, right? We don't have the words. We don't have, we're restricted by the language and the metaphor that we use all the time. But I think getting the sense that, um, the sense that um, it's, it's about um, something almost like flavor, um, you know, but, but with touch, right? So, but spatial, yeah. Uh, Ed and I have a mutual friend named Alexandra Horowitz who runs the uh, Dog Cognition Lab at Bard and who's a wonderful woman has written a series of books that are principally about what it's like to be an olfactory mm -hmm. creature in the world, a sort of nose first instead of an eyes first, as Ed, Ed yeah. was saying, human. And um, uh, she kind of has this joke that like sort of wine tasting is wasted on people, um, <laughs> that you could like imagine like a dog would just have like would just like your tasting notes would leave it in the dust, you know, and have 35 uh, things, a sousant of olive, you know, or something yeah, like that. That's right. um, but I wonder, I suspect that you're going to tell me, and maybe I'm wrong, that there are animals that leave dogs in the dust uh, when it comes to chemical sensation. So, so perhaps, but I, I, and I do want, I will actually, I've got a fun story about Alexandra and the dogs, yeah. but the thing about smell is that um, it is a very, very difficult sense to study and wrap your head around. So why is that? Well, with, with vision, um, I know that light of a certain wavelength has a certain color, and I can measure how much light something is um, sensitive to, like brightness or contrast. Like We understand the physics of light. Smell is about molecules. There are millions, trillions of them, and we still don't know the basics of of really how all of that is is uh, picked up by our um, olfactory receptors and then processed in the brain. So you, c I can look at, I can say light of this wavelength is red or this wavelength is violet. I can't look at the structure of a molecule and tell you what it smells like. No one can. Um, so it's really hard, which also means it's very hard to work out how good a sense of smell an animal has. 
right? Like, I know a mosquito has an amazing sense of smell, as does a rattlesnake. How does that compare to a dog or an elephant? There's no real, like, objective way of working that out. And so you really have to look at the kinds of things that animals use smell for. So it's, a, it's often said that humans have a terrible sense of smell. Um, and it's not nearly as bad as it's made out to be. So when I visited Alexandra's lab, she does this um, little test where she's got a piece of string that's been scented with chocolate, and she'll lay it on the ground. Um, and she asked me to, uh, with a blindfold on, get down on my knees and sniff the path of the string. This to was see if just I for a do. viral video, by the that's way. That's right, no, yeah. No reason. <laughs> um, and, and I could do it, but it took a long time. So I'm down on my knees, I'm going... I, like, I can smell it. I lose, it's very easy for me to lose the path of the thread, but I can re-find it again. And the other thing that's a problem is that I rapidly start hyperventilating because I'm going and, and forgetting to exhale. Now, a dog can do the same thing, but way more quickly um, and without any problem, because partly because its body is built to do that. So. Dogs have nostrils that go from the front round to the sides. Um, when a dog exhales, it creates vortices that move, um, that, that swirl up particles um, on the ground in front of it, sending them up towards its nose. So a dog is smelling on both the inhale and the exhale. It is constantly bringing scent molecules into its nose in a way that I absolutely cannot. Um, <laughs> So the, the dog is, is physically built for a sensory world, and it just uses that sense more often. Smell is primary for a dog. It is the way it interacts with the world. And I would also say, like, while we're waiting for me to write my book, Alexandra's is wonderful on the ways in which dogs perceive smell. Um, we've been having this conversation about all these very fun, different kinds of animal sense types, but I also know that you've got a chapter in this book about animal pain. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be a diversity of experience. I have a, a sense that many of us think of pain in quite a binary way, that you either sort of have it and maybe it's located on a place in your body, but there actually are many species of pain. And I wonder if are there types of animal pain that just sort of blew your mind that were brand new to you in the course of researching this book? Yeah, um, so there is a debate about, um, uh, there is a, this is obviously a huge debate about how to what extent other animals feel pain or not. And some researchers make a distinction between pain and nociception. So nociception is registering that something bad has happened to you, something harmful has occurred. Um, and pain is that plus all the emotional feeling of it. Like, this hurts and I feel really bad about that. Um, those two things, could potentially be dissociable. Some people think they are, so they can be in some animals, some people think that they're not. But there are ways of experiencing pain that I think are really weird. So I think it's, um, so squid. Um, if you, if I cut my hand, it's gonna hurt. And then if I touch that bit later, it still hurts. And I know my hand hurts until such time as it heals. If you, if a squid like loses a, an arm or if you amputate an arm, it will also hurt. And then it seems like it has no idea where that pain is. So it can't localize the source of the pain. It becomes more sensitive in like a whole body way. So if you pro pod like somewhere else, it's gonna have a reaction. That's not the case for octopuses, um, which do have this localization. Um, so I think just in that regard, like it's really weird that these two animals that we that are actually very close, not that closely related, but we think of in the same group, have very very different experiences of what pain might be. And I think it's just a reminder that like things that we think of as being obvious and intuitive play out in very different ways um, across the animal kingdom. Um, you told me uh, in the again in the in the course of discussing this program that you had an entire chapter on the sensing of heat, um, and this, when I was writing my animal consciousness piece, was not something that I came across. Like I was not aware of any sort of distinction in how you might sense heat, 
And I understand you've been just this last week uh, visiting a, a heat lab up at Yale or something. Right. Um, yeah. So tell us about it. Okay, so um, some animals can track down the heat of um, usually prey or hosts. So mosquitoes can sense the body heat of their uh, the people who they bite. Um, but like rattlesnakes um, can sense um, the body heat of their prey. Uh, vampire bats use heat sensors to find blood vessels when they've landed next to a cow or a, or a goat. Um, but um, those are quite specialized uses of heat as a sense. Um, most of us have some capacity to sense heat. I know if I touch a hot plate, that's hot. Or if I, touch a, if I take something out of the fridge, I know that that's cold. And we are all, um, our temperature receptors are all tuned to specific um, temperatures so that we tolerate and we like certain ranges of heat, which is important. Like if we weren't, if we didn't dislike the feeling of something that was incredibly painful to, um, too, hot to um, too hot to tolerate, we would probably die. Um, now, we also know that tons of other animals live in very different temperature conditions than we do. So camels live in the heat, um, small rodents will hibernate over the winter. And I think we often think of those, um, we often think of survival strategies that allow animals to um, exist in those climates without thinking that they also need to actually be comfortable. So a hibernating rodent that spends eight months of the year um, at like four degrees, not only needs to live, but it also needs to be okay with feeling really cold. Um, so the lab I went to um, was run by a woman named Elena Gracheva, who not only studies the rattlesnakes and the vampire bats, but now works on these things called the 13-lined ground squirrels, which do hibernate for 18 months of the year. And they have um, temperature sensors that are tuned very differently to ours. They can be they're totally happy being at four degrees. So we went into her lab, and they, she has like 90 of these squirrels in small Tupperware containers, and they're all just hibernating away. And she pulled one out, and I'm holding this thing that's curled up in my hand like a little furry, adorable tennis ball. And it is cold. It's four degrees. It's like I've just taken something out of the fridge. It's barely moving. It's breathing like maybe once a minute. And it's in this state. But crucially, it is fine with being in that state. So it's not just that things like polar bears or Arctic foxes or hibernators um, can survive in the cold. It's that they're comfortable there. I actually met another guy who studies these things called snowflies, which are um, insects that breed at zero degrees, um, which he found by just keeping some in the fridge to sort of store them. And he opens the fridge and like, there are tons there. Um, if, you put them in, like, if you put them in your hand, they will die. Um, so even something as basic as heat, like things that, you know, I go outside, it might, be, it might feel a bit too hot, stay in an air conditioning room, might feel a bit too cold varies so much across the animal world. We've talked a little bit about animals uh, like us that are vision first or dogs that are olfactory first. Can you tell us um, about an animal that's primarily encounters the world through uh, the mechanical senses, which is to mm -hmm. say uh, uh, touch or vibration or hearing, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, um, let's, do, let's do touch. Um, so, uh, let's everyone... not. <laughs> God. Um, does everyone know what manatees are? Great. Everyone loves manatees. We'll end on it. We'll end on a nice note. Um, so, um, manatees uh, have um, hundreds of whiskers um, on their snouts. Um, and these viscous or vibrissae are incredibly sensitive. So, a manatee's snout is its tactile organ. It's the equivalent of a human hand, and almost just as sensitive. The um, muscles on the lip where the whiskers are are incredibly flexible. So the animal can use its whiskers to process food. It Give it a manatee a head of lettuce, it can tear that lettuce apart with the whiskers and with the lip. It can grab bits, put it in its mouth, take stuff out from the mouth using the whiskers. But the whiskers are also incredibly sensitive. So they'll, they'll interact with each other by, by sort of nuzzling each other with the whiskers in a thing called oripulation, which is like manipulation, except with the mouth oral instead of the hand manus. Um, I got oripulated by a manatee 
in Florida <laughs> earlier this year. I quite enjoyed it. Um, it um, I want to... I want to go to audience questions in a minute, but first, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the cultural implications of all this. Mm -hmm. um, as we learn through your book and uh, really quite a number of sort of things in the popular science space, that animals do uh, inhabit these really rich worlds and sometimes in many ways richer sensory worlds that we ourselves inhabit. Uh, what changes do you think that's going to lead in human culture, in particular in how we interact with animals? Ooh. Um, okay, so I think the, the last chapter in the, about the book is how we have changed the sensory worlds of other animals. Um, so it's about things like light pollution, noise pollution, types of changes to the world that are often invisible to us, but that make a huge difference to the creatures around us. Um, the, just the um, so I recently went to uh, Boise in Idaho, where um, a uh, team of researchers is studying the effect of um, light pollution on bats, on uh, bats and insects and other animals. Um, a lot of the LEDs that are becoming uh, that are uh, becoming really popular and widely used right now um, produce spectra of light that are incredibly disturbing to other creatures. Um, so they'll deter them just by just through their presence, or they might. Attract Trap them in fatal ways. We're all, uh, you know, aware of like moths circling, light bulbs, and so on. It's those kinds of phenomena that we are um, imposing upon the natural world. So the light from our cities, from um, uh, from our infrastructure, extends far beyond what we are usually um, aware of, um, and they can radically change what what um, actually ends up being usable space for other animals. Um, so the, uh, these people I went to see um, are doing this project in, um, in one of the national parks where they replace these LEDs with um, red lamps, um, which are far less, um, far less disturbing um, to a lot of different kinds of wildlife. Um, and it was really striking to me that being in this, um, this environment where they could switch between the LEDs and the red lights, and you know, like it, we're, in, uh, we're in, in the middle of the night, um, the LEDs are on. Um, everything has this sort of harsh glow. You're kind of squinting, even in this like wilderness area. And they switch to red, and suddenly my eyes feel like they're relaxing. I look up, and I can see the Milky Way, which I've never seen in the Northern Hemisphere before. Um, and just, it, it, I think there are so many ways in which, um, in which we have changed the world um, without needing to actually kill or harm any wildlife that still um, excludes them from spaces where we are. And I think one really important thing about understanding the sensory worlds of other animals um, is trying to shape, reshape our world and change what we have done to the wider world in ways that um, pay respect to and cater to those differences. You could imagine uh, that once we get extinction and habitat uh, destruction under control, there being a sort of follow-on movement that makes it so we have like just a much more gentle influence on the sensory worlds of all these all these creatures. Um, questions for Ed? We've got a microphone coming around. Noelle, you might have to go to the other. Oh, okay, we have one there. Hi, Ed. Courtney Sanders Hi. with the Center on Budget and Policy Priority. So definitely not related to my work, but I'm really interested in your research and. I just have a question about the processing of emotions associated with the sensory mm -hmm. process of animals. For example, you mentioned pain. When we stub our toe, we have a source of emotions and we process those. Is that the same for animals and how do, can we learn from that if so? Yeah, so that's a great question. You, do you want to, do you want to? Uh, okay, so, this is your book talk. So, um, yeah. It, so, this is a whole separate side of things, right? Not just what can animals detect, but then how do they react to it? Do they have that same kind of, um, those same kind of emotional triggers that we have? And I think that partly that's, that falls in the unknowable category, but there are some ways in which we can, we can get at that. So um, there, are some, um, there are some bats um, where um, it's, where, the hearing pathways um, in their nervous system hook up to quite directly to emotional centers in their brains. 
Um, and so one, one of the people I spoke to, he studies bats, um, said that he, to, hi, to him, it seemed likely that sounds to them would have the same impact as certain like smells and tastes to us. So if I smell like garbage, I have an instinctive like, oh God, like a very, very strong reflexive emotional reaction to that. Or if I taste, I don't know, a cookie or something, you know, it's, it's very primal in, in, in the way that like looking at like, um, you know, some like, uh, like, uh, I don't know, a tree might not be, um, even though I might enjoy the latter. And so to him, like the, the sense of hearing in the bats might be very similar. So if it hears the sound of a moth that it likes, it might get the sense of like deep joy, you know, this, like ju in the same way that I might get if I smell like baking bread, you know. Hi, my name is Louise Kenny. My organization is me. Uh, so I'm, you're, you're terrific, and I'm really enjoying this talk. Thank you. But on a on a simple kind of basis, a lot of us might have dogs here, right? So we perk up when you say, "Are we doing anything in our lives?" in our home lives, in our environment, that's inappropriate for dogs based on what you know about them. Yeah. You know, like the yeah. LED lights, LED lights, like mm -hmm. any, anything simple like that. So um, Alexandra has some strong views on this, and I definitely recommend reading. Um, so Alexandra Horowitz, um, she's written three books now on, dog, um, on dogs. Uh, one of them focuses on the sense of smell in particular. Um, I, I would buy all three and read them. Like, they're great. But one of the things she said she does is to specifically take her dogs on smell walks so that where the point of the walk is not to get to somewhere or to, like, um, or, or the way she doesn't have, like, a fixed itinerary in mind. Like, often when people walk dogs, you're just sort of dragging them along, right? You want to, like, come on, come on. And if they stop and smell something you stop them from doing that. And her argument is that if you do that too much, you're sort of suppressing some very inherent dogness about them. You know, you're stopping them from engaging with the world with the sense that is their main sense. You know, it's like if you, if you, had, if you went on a hike with, um, with a friend and every time they stopped to look at something, you were like, nope, <laughs> like, you know. And, and I think, you know, we... <laughs> We also stop dogs from interacting with the world in, in smell ways um, that, in, in olfactory ways that we deem to be gross. Um, so, you know, dogs will sniff poop. Dogs will sniff the butts of other dogs. Um, and that's just sort of part of how they interact with the world. But a lot of, uh, you know, I think a lot of dog owners would, would go, that's kind of weird. And, you know, we impose like human sensory values onto them. Um, so I think um, her argument would be like, def like you know, understanding that people need to do their, what, what they need to do, and they need, the dogs need exercise and all of that. Ha build in ways of letting dogs um, be like the smell-driven animals that they are. Um, hi, my name is Kirsten, and I go to school at Mercersburg Academy. Um, so after you talked about how animals process pain, do you think it's morally acceptable for scientists to use live animals for medical reasons that could possibly cure humans? Um, so, so I understand the value of animal research, um, and I think it has um, contributed a huge amount of value to society. Um, it doesn't mean that I um, need to, I think there's a difference between like finding it morally acceptable and liking it. I think a lot I think most people who do research on animals don't don't en there's nothing enjoyable about it. You know, you can you understand that um, your actions may cause pain and suffering to another creature. Um, and the moral question I think is about whether um, that does that has benefits over the in the long run or not. And you know, I would I would argue they do. So I'm a, I am a um, I think well of the necessity to do animal research, even though I personally find like you know I, I think like a lot of people I find it a bit sad. But it's about whether it's you know it's about where, uh, it's it's I, I think the the benefit to cost argument is pretty clear. All right, we've got time for one more. Um, do you think that anthropomorphizing 
is better for our relationship with animals or worse? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think that, you know, I think that it's about um, overly anthropomorphizing animal behavior um, is a problem when we make inferences that are wrong. So, like, a really obvious example. Um, I think some people think, like, misassociate the um, shape of a dolphin's mouth with a smile because they're always upturned. So they have this, uh, uh, they have this sort of um, uh, perception of being like cheery, happy creatures. Um, that, in that sense, it doesn't help us understand the creature itself at all. But then on the flip side of that, you have uh, what people have uh, called anthropodenialism, where you... Um, suggests that there is such a, f a huge gulf between humans and other animals that we cannot ascribe them things like emotions um, or pain or you know other thing uh, like things that we deem to be that have long been deemed to be uniquely human and I think that's also nonsense that also helps us to um, that also stops us from truly understanding what other creatures are um, I do think that. Um, so striking a balance is important. Um, with this book, I'm trying to get people to understand the, the, the uh, perspectives and the mindsets of other creatures. Drawing comparisons to human is, humans is really useful because how else are we going to even make a start? But I think my, my feeling is we want, to, um, we want to understand the animals for their own sakes and in their own rights. Like, so when we, when we think about their senses, um, the cheap thing to do is, are their senses better or worse than ours? And the more interesting question is, how are their senses tailored to their own lives, needs, evolutionary histories? And that's what I'm interested in. Like, the comparison to humans is a good tool for getting people interested in that. But, you know, I don't think, I, I, I think it's, um, I guess, I, I guess I'm arguing on the spot that worse than anthropomorphism is narcissism. Um, and that's what I'm trying to avoid. All right, give it up for Ed Young. <laughs> and uh, don't forget to buy his book in like two years <laughs> two or whatever. Two years, that's right. <laughs>